Chapters 12 and 13 of The Red Battle Flyer by Captain Manfred Freiherr von Richthofen. Translated by T.L.S. Barker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter 12. Schaefer Lands Between the Lines. We went on a shooting expedition on the 20th of April. We came home very late and lost Schaefer on the way. Of course, everyone hoped that he would come to hand before dark. It struck nine, it struck ten, but no Schaefer was visible. His benzine could not last so long. Consequently, he had landed somewhere, for no one was willing to admit that he had been shot down. No one dared to mention the possibility. Still, everyone was afraid for him. The ubiquitous telephone was set in motion in order to find out whether a flying man had come down anywhere nobody could give us information. No division and no brigade had seen anything of him. We felt very uncomfortable. At last we went to bed. All of us were perfectly convinced that he would turn up in the end. At two o'clock after midnight I was suddenly awakened. The telephone orderly, beaming with pleasure, reported to me, Schaefer is in the village of Y and would like to be fetched home. The next morning when we were sitting at breakfast the door opened and my dear pilot stood before me. His clothes were as filthy as those of an infantryman who has fought at Arras for a fortnight. He was greeted with a general hurrah. Schaefer was tremendously happy and elated and tremendously excited about his adventure. When he had finished his breakfast, he told us the following tale. I was flying along the front intending to return home. Suddenly I noticed far below me something that looked like an infantry flyer. I attacked him, shot him down, and meant to fly back. However, the English in the trenches did not mean me to get away, and started peppering me like anything. My salvation lay in the rapidity of my machine, for those rascals, of course, would forget that they had to aim far in front of me if they wished to hit me. I was at an altitude of perhaps six hundred feet. Suddenly I heard a smash, and my engine stopped running. There was nothing to do but land. I asked myself whether I should be able to get away from the English position. It seemed very questionable. The English noticed my predicament and started shooting like mad. As my engine was no longer running, I could hear every single shot. The position became awkward. I came down and landed. Before my machine had come to a standstill, they squirted upon me heaps of bullets from machine guns in the hedge of the village of Monche near Arras. My machine became splashed with bullets. I jumped out of it and down into the first shell hole. Squatting there, I reflected and tried to realize exactly where I was. Gradually it became clear to me that I had landed outside the English lines, but cursedly near them. Happily it was rather late in the evening, and that was my salvation. Before long the first shell came along. Of course, they were gas shells, and I had no mask with me. My eyes started watering like anything. Before darkness set in, the English ascertained the distance of the spot where I had landed with machine guns. Part of them aimed at my machine and part at my shell crater. The bullets constantly hit its rim. In order to quiet my nerves, I lit a cigarette. Then I took off my heavy fur coat and prepared everything for a leap and a run. Every minute seemed to me an hour. Gradually it became dark, but only very gradually. Around me I heard partridges giving a concert. As an experienced shot I recognized from their voices that they felt quite happy and contented, that there was no danger of my being surprised in my hiding place. At last it became quite dark. Suddenly and quite close to me a couple of partridges flew up. A second couple followed. It was obvious that danger was approaching. No doubt a patrol was on the way to wish me a happy evening. I had no time to lose now or never. First I crept very cautiously in my chest from shell hole to shell hole. After creeping industriously for about an hour and a half, I noticed I was nearing humans. Were they English or were they Germans? They came nearer and I could almost have fallen round their necks when I discovered our own musketeers. They were a German patrol who were nosing about in no man's land. One of the men conducted me to the commander of his company. I was told that in the evening I had landed about fifty yards in front of the enemy lines, and that our infantry had given me up for lost. I had a good supper, 
and then I started on my way home. Behind me there was far more shooting than in front of me. Every path, every trench, every bush, every hollow was under enemy fire. The English attacked on the next morning, and consequently they had to begin their artillery preparation the evening before, so I had chosen an unfavorable day for my enterprise. I reached the first telephone only at two o'clock in the morning when I phoned to the squadron. We were all very happy to have our Schaefer again with us. We went to bed. Any other man would have taken a rest from flying for twenty-four hours. But on the afternoon of this very day, friend Schaefer attacked a low-flying B.E. above Mosche. The anti ruckhofen Squadron The English had hit upon a splendid joke. They intended to catch me or to bring me down. For that purpose they had actually organized a special squadron which flew about in that part which we frequented as a rule. We discovered its particular aim by the fact that its aggressive activity was principally directed against our red machines. I would say that all the machines of the squadron had been painted red because our English friends had by and by perceived that I was sitting in a blood-red man-box. Suddenly there were quite a lot of red machines, and the English opened their eyes wide when one fine day they saw a dozen red barges streaming along instead of a single one. Our new trick did not prevent them from making an attempt at attacking us. I preferred their new tactics. It is better that one's customers come to one's shop than to have to look for them abroad. We flew to the front, hoping to find our enemy. After about twenty minutes, the first arrived and attacked us. That had not happened to us for a long time. The English had abandoned their celebrated offensive tactics to some extent. They had found them somewhat too expensive. Our aggressors were three spod, one-seater machines. Their occupants thought themselves very superior to us because of the excellence of their apparatus. Wolf, my brother, and I were flying together. We were three against three. That was as it ought to be. Immediately at the beginning of the encounter, the aggressive became a defensive. Our superiority became clear. I tackled my opponent and could see how my brother and Wolf handled each his own enemy. The usual waltzing began. We were circling around one another. A favorable wind came to our aid. It drove us fighting away from the front in the direction of Germany. My man was the first who fell down. I suppose I had smashed up his machine. At any rate, he made up his mind to land. I no longer gave pardon to him. Therefore I attacked him a second time, and the consequence was that his whole machine went to pieces. His planes dropped off like pieces of paper, and the body of the machine fell like a stone burning fiercely. It dropped into a morass. It was impossible to dig it out, and I have never discovered the name of my opponent. He had disappeared. Only the end of the tail was visible, and marked the place where he had dug his own grave. Simultaneously with me, Wolf and my brother had attacked their opponents and had forced them to land not far from my victim. We were very happy and flew home and hoped that the anti Richthofen squadron would often return to the fray. We are visited by my father. My father had announced that he would visit his two sons on the twenty ninth of April. My father is a commander of a little town in the vicinity of Lille. Therefore, he does not live very far away from us. I have occasionally seen him on my flights. He intended to arrive by train at nine o'clock. At half-past nine he came to our aerodrome. We just happened to have returned from an expedition. My brother was the first to climb out of his machine, and he greeted the old gentleman with the words, "'Good day, father. I have just shot down an Englishman.' Immediately afterward I also climbed out of my machine and greeted him, "'Good day, father. I have just shot down an Englishman.' The old gentleman felt very happy, and he was delighted. That was obvious. He is not one of those fathers who are afraid for their sons. I think he would like best to get into a machine himself and help us shoot. We breakfasted with him and then went flying again. In the meantime, an aerial fight took place above our aerodrome. My father looked on and was greatly interested. We did not take a hand in the fight, for we were standing on the ground and looked on ourselves. An English squadron had broken through and was being attacked above our aerodrome by some of our own reconnoitering aeroplanes. 
Suddenly one of the machines started turning over and over. Then it recovered itself and came gliding down normally. We saw with regret this time that it was a German machine. The Englishman flew on. The German aeroplane had apparently been damaged. It was quite correctly handled. It came down and tried to land on our flying ground. The room was rather narrow for the large machine. Besides, the ground was unfamiliar to the pilot. Hence the landing was not quite smooth. We ran towards the aeroplane and discovered with regret that one of the occupants of the machine, the machine gunner, had been killed. The spectacle was new to my father. It made him serious. The day promised to be a favorable one for us. The weather was wonderfully clear. The anti-aircraft guns were constantly audible. Obviously there was much aircraft about. Towards midday we flew once more. This time I was again lucky and shot down my second Englishman of the day. The governor recovered his good spirits. After the midday dinner I slept a little. I was again quite fresh. Wolf had fought the enemy in the meantime with his group of machines and had himself bagged an enemy. Schaefer also had eaten one. In the afternoon my brother and I, accompanied by Schaefer, Fessner, and Almenruder, flew twice more. The first afternoon flight was a failure. The second was all the better. Soon after we had come to the front a hostile squadron met us. Unfortunately they occupied a higher altitude, so we could not do anything. We tried to climb to their level, but did not succeed. We had to let them go. We flew along the front. My brother was next to me, in front of the others. Suddenly I noticed two hostile artillery flyers approaching our front in the most impertinent and provocative manner. I waved to my brother, and he understood my meaning. We flew side by side, increasing our speed. Each of us felt certain that he was superior to the enemy. It was a great thing that we could absolutely rely on one another, and that was the principal thing. One has to know one's flying partner. My brother was the first to approach his enemy. He attacked the first, and I took care of the second. At the last moment, I quickly looked round in order to feel sure that there was no third aeroplane about. We were alone and could see eye to eye. Soon I had got on the favorable side of my opponent. A short spell of quick firing, and the enemy machine went to pieces. I never had a more rapid success. While I was still looking where my enemy's fragments were falling, I noticed my brother. He was scarcely five hundred yards away from me and was still fighting his opponent. I had time to study the struggle and must say that I myself could not have done any better than he did. He had rushed his man and both were turning around one another. Suddenly the enemy machine reared. That is a certain indication of a hit. Probably the pilot was shot in the head. The machine fell and the planes of the enemy apparatus went to pieces they fell quite close to my victim. I flew towards my brother, and we congratulated one another by waving. We were highly satisfied with our performance and flew off. It is a splendid thing when one can fly together with one's brother and do so well. In the meantime, the other fellows of the squadron had drawn near and were watching the spectacle of the fight of the two brothers. Of course, they could not help us, for only one man can shoot down an opponent. If one airman has tackled his enemy, the others cannot assist. They can only look on and protect his back. Otherwise, he might be attacked in the rear. We flew on and went on to a higher altitude, for there was apparently a meeting somewhere in the air for the members of the anti-Richthofen club. They could recognize us from far away. In the powerful sunlight, the beautiful red color of our machines could be seen at a long distance. We closed our ranks, for we knew that our English friends pursued the same business as we. Unfortunately, they were again too high, so we had to wait for their attack. The celebrated triplanes and spots were perfectly new machines. However, the quality of the box matters little. Success depends upon the man who sits in it. The English airmen played a cautious game, but would not bite. We offered to fight them, either on one side of the front or on the other but they said, no thank you, what is the good of bringing out a squadron against us and then turning tail? At last one of the men plucked up courage and dropped down upon our rear machine. 
Naturally, battle was accepted, although our position was unfavorable. If you wish to do business, you must, after all, adapt yourself to the desires of your customers. Therefore, we all turned round. The Englishman noticed what was going on and got away. The battle had begun. Another Englishman tried a similar trick on me, and I greeted him at once with quick fire from my two machine guns. He tried to escape me by dropping down. That was fatal to him. When he got beneath me, I remained on top of him. Everything in the air that is beneath me, especially if it is a one-seater, a chaser, is lost, for it cannot shoot to the rear. My opponent had a very good and very fast machine. However, he did not succeed in reaching the English lines. I began to fire at him when we were above lens. I started shooting when I was much too far away. That was merely a trick of mine. I did not mean so much to hit him as to frighten him, and I succeeded in catching him. He began flying curves, and this enabled me to draw near. I tried the same maneuver a second and a third time. Every time my foolish friend started making his curves, I gradually edged quite close to him. I approached him almost to touching distance. I aimed very carefully. I waited a moment, and when I was at most a distance of fifty yards from him, I started with both the machine guns at the same time. I heard a slight hissing noise, a certain sign that the benzene tanks had been hit. Then I saw a bright flame, and my lord disappeared below. This was the fourth victim of the day. My brother had bagged two. Apparently we had invited our father to a treat. His joy was wonderful. I had invited several gentlemen for the evening. Among these was my dear Vedel, who happened to be in the neighborhood. We had a great treat. The two brothers had bagged six Englishmen in a single day. That is a whole flying squadron. I believe the English ceased to feel any sympathy for us. I fly home. I had shot down fifty aeroplanes. That was a good number, but I would have preferred fifty-two. So I went up one day and had another two, although it was against orders. As a matter of fact, I had been allowed to bag only forty-one. Anyone will be able to guess why the number was fixed at forty-one. Just for that reason, I wanted to avoid that figure. I am not out for breaking records. Besides, generally speaking, we of the Flying Corps do not think of records at all. We merely think of our duty. Volka might have shot down a hundred aeroplanes, but for his accident, and many others of our dear dead comrades might have vastly increased their bag, but for their sudden death. Still, it is some fun to have downed half a hundred aeroplanes. After all, I had succeeded in obtaining permission to bring down fifty machines before going on leave. I hope that I may live to celebrate a second lot of fifty. In the evening of that particular day, the telephone bell was ringing. Headquarters wished to speak to me. It seemed to me the height of fun to be connected with the Holy of Holies. Over the wire they gave me the cheerful news that His Majesty had expressed the wish to make my personal acquaintance and had fixed the date for me. I had to make an appearance on the 2nd of May. The notification reached me on the 30th of April at nine o'clock in the evening. I should not have been able to fulfill the wish of our all-highest warlord by taking the train. I therefore thought I would travel by air, especially as that mode of locomotion is far pleasanter. I started the next morning not in my single-seater Le Petit Rouge, but in a big fat double-seater. I took a seat at the rear, not the sticks. The man who had to do the flying was Lieutenant Kraft, one of the officers of my squadron. He was just going on furlough to recover his strength, so that it suited him admirably to act as my pilot. We reached home more quickly, traveling by air, and he preferred the trip by aeroplane. I started on the journey rather hastily. The only luggage which I took with me was my toothbrush. Therefore I had to dress for the journey in the clothes in which I was to appear at headquarters. Now a soldier does not carry with him many beautiful uniforms when he goes to war, and the scarcity of nice clothes is particularly great in the case of such a poor front hog as myself. My brother undertook the command of the aeroplane squadron in my absence. I took leave with a few words for I hope soon to recommence my work among those dear fellows. The flight went via Nemours, Liège, 
et la chapelle and cologne it was lovely for once to sail through the air without any thoughts of war the weather was wonderful we had rarely had such a perfect time probably the men at the front would be extremely busy soon our own captive balloons were lost to sight the thunder of the battle of arras was only heard in the distance beneath us all was peace we saw steamers on the rivers and fast trains on the railways we easily overtook everything below the wind was in our favor the earth seemed as flat as a threshing floor the beautiful mountains of the meuse were not recognizable as mountains one could not even trace them by their shadows for the sun was right above us we only knew that they were there and with a little imagination we could hide ourselves in the cool glades of that delightful country it had become late clouds were gathering below it hid us from the earth we flew on taking our directions by means of the sun and the compass the vicinity of holland was disagreeable to us we decided to go lower in order to find out where we were we went beneath the cloud and discovered that we were above namur we then went on to Aix la chapelle we left that town to our left and about midday we reached cologne we both were in high spirits we had before us a long leave of absence the weather was beautiful we had succeeded in all our undertakings we had reached cologne we could be certain to get to headquarters in time whatever might happen our coming had been announced in cologne by telegram people were looking out for us on the previous day the newspapers had reported my fifty-second aerial victory one can imagine what kind of a reception they had prepared for us. Having been flying for three hours, I had a slight headache. Therefore, I thought I would take forty winks before going to headquarters. From Cologne, we flew along the Rhine for some distance. I knew the country well. I had often journeyed that way by steamer, by motor car, and by railway, and now I was traveling by aeroplane. It is difficult to say which of these is the most pleasant form of locomotion. Of course, one can see the details of the landscape better from the steamer. However, the commanding view one gets from an aeroplane has also its attractions. The Rhine is a very beautiful river, from above as well as from any other viewpoint. We flew rather low in order not to lose the sensation that we were traveling among mountains, for after all, the most beautiful part of the Rhine or the tree-clad hills and castles. Of course, we could not make out individual houses. It is a pity that one cannot fly slowly and quickly. If it had been possible, I would have flown quite slowly. The beautiful views which we saw vanished only too quickly. Nevertheless, when one flies high in the air, one never has the sensation that one is proceeding at a fast pace. If you are sitting in a motor car or in a fast train, you have the impression of tremendous speed. On the other hand, you seem to be advancing slowly when you fly in an aeroplane at a considerable speed. You notice the celerity of your progress only when you have not looked out of your machine for four or five minutes, and then try to find out where you are. Then the aspect of the country appears suddenly completely changed. The terrain which you passed over a little while ago looks quite different under a different angle, and you do not recognize the scenery you have passed. Herein lies the reason that an airman can easily lose his way if he forgets for a moment to examine the territory. In the afternoon we arrived at headquarters and were cordially received by some comrades with whom I was acquainted and who had worked at the holiest of holies. I absolutely pitied those poor ink spillers they get only half the fun in war. First of all, I went to the general commanding the air forces. On the next morning came the great moment when I was to meet Hindenburg and Ludendorff. I had to wait for quite a while. I should find it difficult to describe my encounter with these generals. I saw Hindenburg first, and then Ludendorff. It is a weird feeling to be in the room where the fate of the world is decided. I was quite glad when I was again outside the holiest of holies, and when I had been commanded to lunch with His Majesty. The day was the day of my birth, and somebody had apparently told His Majesty. He congratulated me in the first place on my success, and in the second on my twenty-fifth birthday. At the same time he handed me a small birthday present. 
Formerly I would never have believed it possible that on my twenty-fifth birthday I would be sitting at the right of General Field Marshal von Hindenburg and that I would be mentioned by him in a speech. On the day following I was to take midday dinner with Her Majesty, and so I went to Homburg. Her Majesty also gave me a birthday present, and I had the great pleasure to show her how to start an aeroplane. In the evening I was again invited by General Field Marshal von Hindenburg. The day following I flew to Freiburg to do some shooting. At Freiburg I made use of the flying machine which was going to Berlin by air. In Nuremberg I replenished my tanks with benzene. A thunderstorm was coming on. I was in a great hurry to get to Berlin. Various more or less interesting things awaited me there. So I flew on, the thunderstorm notwithstanding. I enjoyed the clouds and the beastly weather. The rain fell in streams. Sometimes it hailed. Always the propeller had the most extraordinary aspect. The hailstones had damaged it considerably. The blades looked like saws. Unfortunately, I enjoyed the bad weather so much that I quite forgot to look about me. When I remembered that one has to look out, it was too late. I had no longer any idea where I was. That was a nice position to be in. I had lost my way in my own country. My people at home would laugh when they knew it. However, there it was, and couldn't be helped. I had no idea where I was. Owing to a powerful wind, I had been driven out of my course and off my map. Guided by sun and compass, I tried to get the direction of Berlin. Towns, villages, hills, and forests were slipping away below me. I did not recognize a thing. I tried in vain to compare the picture beneath my map. Everything was different. I found it impossible to recognize the country. Later on I discovered the impossibility of finding my way, for I was flying about sixty miles outside my map. After having flown for a couple of hours my guide and I resolved to land somewhere in the open. That is always unpleasant. One cannot tell how the surface of the ground is in reality. If one of the wheels gets into a hole, one's box is converted into matchwood. We tried to read the name written upon a station, but of course that was impossible, it was too small. So we had to land. We did it with a heavy heart, for nothing else could be done. We looked for a meadow which appeared suitable from above, and tried our luck. Close inspection, unfortunately, showed that the meadow was not as pleasant as it seemed. The fact was obviously proved by the slightly bent frame of our machine. We had made ourselves gloriously ridiculous. We had first lost our way, and then smashed the machine. So we had to continue our journey with a commonplace conveyance by railway train. Slowly but surely we reached Berlin. We had landed in the neighborhood of Leipzig. If we had not landed so stupidly, we would certainly have reached Berlin. But sometimes you make a mistake, whatever you do. Some days later I arrived in Schweidnitz, my own town. Although I got there at seven o'clock in the morning, there was a large crowd at the station. I was very cordially received. In the afternoon various demonstrations took place to honor me, among others, one of the local Boy Scouts. It became clear to me that the people at home took a vivid interest in their fighting soldiers, after all. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 My Brother I had not yet passed eight days of my leave when I received the telegram, though Torres wounded but not mortally. That was all. Inquiries showed that he had been very rash. He flew against the enemy, together with Almanroder. Beneath him and a good distance on the other side of the front, he saw in the air a lonely Englishman crawling about. He was one of those hostile infantry flyers who make themselves particularly disagreeable to our troops. We molest them a great deal. Whether they really achieve anything in crawling along the ground is very problematical. My brother was at an altitude of about 6,000 feet, while the Englishman was at about 3,000 feet. He quietly approached the Englishman, prepared to plunge, and in a few seconds was upon him. The Englishman thought he would avoid a duel, and he disappeared likewise by a plunge. My brother, without hesitation, plunged after. He didn't care at all whether he was on one side of the front or the other. He was animated by a single thought. 
I must down that fellow. That is, of course, the correct way of managing things. Now and then I myself have acted that way. However, if my brother does not have at least one success on every flight, he gets tired of the whole thing. Only a little above the ground my brother obtained a favorable position towards the English flyer and could shoot into his shop windows. The Englishman fell. There was nothing more to be done. After such a struggle, especially at a low altitude, in the course of which one has so often been twisting and turning and circling to the right and to the left, the average mortal has no longer the slightest notion of his position. On that day it happened that the air was somewhat misty. The weather was particularly unfavorable. My brother quickly took his bearings and discovered only then that he was a long distance behind the front. He was behind the ridge of Vimy. The top of that hill is about three hundred feet higher than the country around. My brother, so the observers on the ground reported, had disappeared behind the Vimy height. It is not a particularly pleasant feeling to fly home over enemy country. One is shot at and cannot shoot back. It is true, however, that a hit is rare. My brother approached the line. At a low altitude one can hear every shot that is fired, and firing sounds then very much like the noise made by chestnuts which are being roasted. Suddenly he felt that he had been hit. That was queer to him. My brother is one of those men who cannot see their own blood. If somebody else was bleeding it would not impress him very greatly, but the sight of his own blood upsets him. He felt his blood running down his right leg in a warm stream. At the same time he noticed a pain in his hip. Below the shooting continued. It followed that he was still over hostile ground. At last the firing gradually ceased. He had crossed the front. Now he must be nimble for his strength was rapidly ebbing away. He saw a wood and next to the wood a meadow. Straight for the meadow he flew and mechanically, almost unconsciously, he switched off the engine. At the same moment he lost consciousness. My brother was in a single cedar. No one could help him. It is a miracle that he came to the ground, for no flying machine lands or starts automatically. There is a rumor that they have at Cologne an old taub which will start by itself as soon as the pilot takes the seat, which makes the regulation curve and lands again after exactly five minutes. Many men pretend to have seen that miraculous machine. I have not seen it, but still I am convinced that the tale is true. Now, my brother was not in such a miraculous automatic machine. Nevertheless, he had not hurt himself in landing. He recovered consciousness only in hospital and was sent to Bois. It is a curious feeling to see one's brother fighting with an Englishman. Once I saw that Lothar, who was lagging behind the squadron, was being attacked by an English aviator. It would have been easy for him to avoid battle. He need only plunge. But he would not do that. That would not even occur to him. He does not know how to run away. Happily, I had observed what was going on and was looking for my chance. I noticed that the Englishman went for my brother and shot at him. My brother tried to reach the Englishman's altitude, disregarding the shots. Suddenly his machine turned a somersault and plunged perpendicularly, turning round and round. It was not an intended plunge, but a regular fall. That is not a nice thing to look at, especially if the falling airman is one's own brother. Gradually I had to accustom myself to that sight, for it was one of my brother's tricks. As soon as he felt sure that the Englishman was his superior, he acted as if he had been shot. The Englishman rushed after him. My brother recovered his balance and in a moment had got above his enemy. The hostile aeroplane could not equally quickly get ready for what was to come. My brother caught it at a favorable angle, and a few seconds after it went down in flames. When a machine is burning, all is lost, for it falls to the ground burning. Once I was on the ground next to a benzene tank. It contained one hundred liters of benzene, which exploded and burnt. The heat was so great that I could not bear to be within ten yards of it. One can therefore imagine what it means if a tank containing a large quantity of this devilish liquid explodes a few engines in front of one while the blast from the propeller blows the flame into one's face. I believe a man must lose consciousness at the very first moment. Sometimes miracles do happen. For instance, 
I once saw an English aeroplane falling down in flames. The flames burst out only at an altitude of 1,500 feet. The whole machine was burning. When we had flown home, we were told that one of the occupants of the machine had jumped from an altitude of 150 feet. It was the observer. 150 feet is the height of a good-sized steeple. Supposing somebody should jump from its top to the ground, what would be his condition? Most men would break their bones in jumping from a first-floor window. At any rate, this good fellow jumped from a burning machine at an altitude of 150 feet from a machine which had been burning for over a minute, and nothing happened to him except a simple fracture of the leg. Soon after his adventure he made a statement from which it appears that his nerve had not suffered. Another time I shot down an Englishman. The pilot had been fatally wounded in the head. The machine fell perpendicularly to earth from an altitude of 9,000 feet. Some time later I came gliding down and saw on the ground nothing but a heap of twisted debris. To my surprise I was told that the observer had only damaged his skull and that his condition was not dangerous. Some people have luck indeed. Once upon a time Boca shot down a Nupo machine. I was present. The aeroplane fell like a stone. When we had inspected it, we found that it had been driven up to the middle in the loamy soil. The occupant had been shot in the abdomen and had lost consciousness and had wrenched his arm out of its socket on striking the ground. He did not die of his fall. On the other hand, it has happened that a good friend of mine in landing had a slight accident. One of the wheels of his machine got into a rabbit hole. The aeroplane was traveling at no speed and quite slowly went on its head. It seemed to reflect whether it should fall to one side or to the other, turned over, and the poor fellow's back was broken. My brother Lothar is lieutenant in the 4th Dragoons. Before the war he was at the War Academy. He was made an officer at the outbreak and began the war as a cavalryman, exactly as I did. I know nothing about his actions, for he never speaks of himself. However, I have been told the following story. In the winter of 1914, Lothar's regiment was on the warp. The Russians were on the other side of the river. Nobody knew whether they intended to stay there or to go back. The water was frozen partly along the shore, so it was difficult to ride through the water. There were, of course, no bridges, for the Russians had destroyed them. So my brother swam across, ascertained the position of the Russians, and swam back again. He did that during a severe Russian winter when the thermometer was very low. After a few minutes his clothes were frozen solid, yet he asserted that he had felt quite warm notwithstanding. He kept on his horse all day long until he got to his quarters in the evening, yet he did not catch a chill. In winter 1915 he followed my urgent advice and went into the flying service. He also became an observer and became a pilot only a year later. Acting as an observer is certainly not a bad training, particularly for a chasing airman. In March 1917 he passed his third examination and came at once to my squadron. When he arrived he was a very young and innocent pilot who never thought of looping and such like tricks. He was quite satisfied if he succeeded in starting his machine and in landing successfully. A fortnight later I took him with me against the enemy for the first time. I asked him to fly close behind me in order that he might see exactly how the fighting was done. After the third flight with him I suddenly noticed he parted company with me. He rushed at an Englishman and killed him. My heart leapt with joy when I saw it. The event proved once more that there is no art in shooting down an aeroplane. The thing is done by the personality or by the fighting determination of the airman. I am not a pigo, and I do not wish to be a pigo. I am only a soldier who does his duty. Four weeks later my brother had shot down a total of twenty Englishmen. His record as a flyer is probably unique. It has probably not happened in any other case that a pilot, a fortnight after his third examination, has shot down his first enemy, and that he has shot down twenty during the first four weeks of his fighting life. My brother's twenty-second opponent was a celebrated Captain Ball. He was by far the best English flyer. Major Hawker, who in his time was as renowned as Captain Ball, I had pressed to my bosom some months previously. 
it was a particular pleasure to me that it fell to my brother to settle England's second flying champion. Captain Ball flew a triplane and encountered my brother flying by himself at the front. Each tried to catch the other. Neither gave his opponent a chance. Every encounter was a short one. They were constantly dashing at one another. Neither succeeded in getting behind the other. Suddenly both resolved to fire a few well-aimed shots during the few moments of the encounter. Both rushed at one another and fired. Both had before them their engine. The probability of a hit was very small, for their speed was twice as great as normally. It was improbable that either should succeed. My brother, who was a little lower, had pulled his machine around too hard, and the result was that it overturned. For a moment his aeroplane became unsteerable but presently he recovered control and found out that his opponent had smashed both his benzene tanks. Therefore he had to stop the engine and land it quickly, otherwise his machine might burst into flames. His next idea was, what has become of my opponent? At the moment when his machine turned in somersault, he had seen that the enemy's machine was rearing up in the air and had also turned a somersault. He therefore could not be very far. His whole thought was, is he above me or beneath me? He was not above, but he saw the triplane falling down in a series of somersaults. It fell, fell, fell until it came to the ground where it was smashed to pieces. This happened on German territory. Both opponents had hit one another with their machine guns. My brother's machine had had both benzene tanks smashed, and at the same moment Captain Ball had been shot through the head. He carried with him some photographs and cuttings from the newspapers of his town, where he had been greatly fated. In Volka's time Captain Ball destroyed thirty-six German machines. He, too, had found his master. Was it by chance that a prominent man such as he also should die an ordinary soldier's death? Captain Ball was certainly the commander of the anti-Richthofen squadron. I believe that the Englishmen will now give up their attempt to catch me. I should regret it, for in that case I should miss many opportunities to make myself beloved by them. Had my brother not been wounded on the 5th of May, he would probably, on my return from furlough, also have been given a leave of absence, with fifty-two hostile machines to his credit. My father discriminates between a sportsman and a butcher. The former shoots for fun. When I have shot down an Englishman, my hunting passion is satisfied for a quarter of an hour. Therefore I do not succeed in shooting two Englishmen in succession. If one of them comes down I have the feeling of complete satisfaction. Only much, much later I have overcome my instinct and have become a butcher. My brother is differently constituted. I had an opportunity of observing him when he was shooting down his fourth and fifth opponents. We were attacking in a squadron. I started to dance. I had settled my opponent very quickly. When I looked around, I noticed my brother rushing after an English machine which was bursting into flames and exploded. Next to it was another Englishman. My brother, though following number one, immediately directed his machine gun against number two, although his first opponent was still in the air and had not yet fallen. His second victim also fell after a short struggle. When we met at home, he asked me proudly, How many have you shot down? I said quite modestly, One. He turned his back upon me and said, I did too. Thereupon I sent him forward to make inquiries. He was to find out the names of his victims, etc. He returned late in the afternoon, having been able to find only a single Englishman. He had looked carelessly, as is usual amongst such butchers. Only on the following day I received a report as to the place where the second had come down. We all had seen his fall. I shoot a bison. When visiting headquarters I met the Prince von Pless. He permitted me to shoot a bison on his estate. The bison has died out. On the whole earth there are only two spots where bisons may be found. These are the Pless estate and in the Bailowis estate of the ex -Zar. The Bailowis forest has, of course, suffered terribly through the war. Many a magnificent bison which ought to have been shot either by the Tsar or by some other monarch has been eaten by German musketeers. Through the kindness of the prince I was permitted to shoot so rare an animal. In a few decades none will be left. I arrived at Pless on the afternoon of the 26th of May 
and had to start immediately from the station if I wished to kill a bull the same evening. We drove along a celebrated road through the giant preserves of the Prince, which has been frequented by many crowned heads. After about an hour we got out and had to walk half an hour to come to the shooting place. The drivers had already been placed in position. The signal was given to them, and they began to drive. I stood at an elevated spot which had been occupied, according to the head forester, by His Majesty, who from thence had shot many a bison. We waited some considerable time. Suddenly I saw among the timber a giant black monster rolling along. It came straight in my direction. I noticed it before the head forester had. I got ready for firing, and must say that I felt somewhat feverish. It was a mighty bull. When he was at a distance of two hundred yards, there was still some hope for him. I thought it was too far for a shot. Of course, I could have hit the monster because it was impossible to miss such a huge beast. However, it would have been unpleasant to search for him. Besides, it would have been ridiculous had I missed him, so I thought I would wait until he came nearer. Probably he noticed the drivers, for he suddenly turned and came rushing towards me at a sharp angle and at a speed which seemed to me incredible. It was a bad position for a shot, and in a moment he disappeared behind a group of stout trees. I heard him snorting and stamping. I lost sight of him. I have no idea whether he smelt me or not. At any rate, he had disappeared. I caught another glimpse of him at a long distance, and he was gone. I do not know whether it was the unaccustomed aspect of the animal, or whether something else affected me. At any rate, at the moment when the bull came near, I had the same feeling, the same feverishness which seizes me when I am sitting in my aeroplane, and notice an Englishman at so great a distance that I have to fly perhaps five minutes in order to get near him. The only difference is that the Englishman defends himself. Possibly different feelings would have moved me had I been standing on level ground and not on an elevated position. Before long a second bison came near. He was also a huge fellow. He made it easier for me to fire my shot. At a distance of eighty yards I fired at him, but I had missed my opportunity to shoot him in the shoulder. A month before Hindenburg had told me when talking of bison, you must take a lot of cartridges with you. I have spent on such a fellow half a dozen, for he does not die easily. His heart lies so deep that one misses it as a rule. That was really so. Although I knew exactly where the bison's heart was, I had missed it. I fired a second shot and a third. Hit for the third time, the bull stopped perhaps fifty yards from me. Five minutes later, the beast was dead. The shooting was finished. All three bullets had hit him close above the heart. We drove now past the beautiful hunting box of the prince through the forest in which the guests of Prince Plaz shoot every year deer and other animals. Then we looked at the interior of the house in Promnitz. It is situated on a peninsula. It commands beautiful views, and for three miles around there is no human being. One has no longer the feeling that one is in a preserve of the ordinary kind when one visits the estate of Prince Plaz, for the preserve extends to a million acres. It contains glorious stags which have never been seen by man. No forester knows them. Occasionally they are shot. One can tramp about for weeks without seeing a bison. During certain times of the year it is impossible to find one. They like quietude, and they can hide themselves in the gigantic forest and tangled woods. We saw many beautiful deer. After about two hours we arrived at Plez, just before it became dark. Infantry flyers, artillery flyers, and reconnoitering machines. Had I not become a professional chaser I should have turned an infantry flyer. After all, it must be a very satisfactory feeling to be able to aid those troops whose work is hardest. The infantry flyer can do a great deal to assist the man on foot. For that reason his is a very grateful task. In the course of the Battle of Arras I observed many of these splendid fellows. They flew in any weather and at any time at low altitude over the enemy and tried to act as connecting links with our hard-pressed troops. I can understand that one can fight with enthusiasm when one is given such a task. I dare say many an airman has shouted hurrah when, after an assault, he saw the hostile masses stream back 
or when our smart infantry leaped from the trenches and fought the aggressors eye to eye. Many a time after a chasing expedition I have fired my remaining cartridges into the enemy trenches. Although I may have done little practical good, such firing affects the enemy's morale. I have also been an artillery flyer. In my time it was a novelty to regulate the firing of one's own artillery by wireless telegraphy. To do this well, an airman requires special talent. I could not do the work for long. I prefer fighting. Very likely, artillery officers make the best artillery flyers. At least they have the necessary knowledge of the arm which they serve. I have done a lot of reconnoitering by airplane, particularly in Russia during the War of Movement. Then I acted once more as a cavalryman. The only difference was that I rode a pegasus made of steel. My days spent with friend Holk among the Russians were among the finest in my life. In the Western theater, the eye of the reconnaissance flyer sees things which are very different from those to which the cavalryman gets accustomed. Villages and towns, railways and roads seem lifeless and dead. Yet there is a colossal traffic going on all the time but it is hidden from the flying men with great skill. Only a wonderfully trained, practiced, and observant eye can see anything definite when one is traveling at a great height and at a terrific speed. I have excellent eyes, but it seems doubtful to me whether there is anyone who can see anything definite when he looks down upon a road from an altitude of 15,000 feet. As the eye is an imperfect object for observation, one replaces it by the photographic apparatus. Everything that seems important to one must be photographed. Besides, one must photograph those things which one is told to photograph. If one comes home and if the plates have gone wrong, the whole flight has been for nothing. It often happens to flying men who do reconnoitering that they get involved in a fight. However, their task is more important than fighting. Frequently, a photographic plate is more valuable than the shooting down of a squadron. Hence, the flying photographer should, as a rule, not take a hand in fighting. Nowadays, it is a difficult task to reconnoiter efficiently in the West. The German Flying Machines In the course of the war, the German flying machines have experienced great changes. That is probably generally known. There is a colossal difference between a giant plane and a chaser plane. The chaser plane is small, fast, quick at turning. It carries nothing apart from the pilot, except machine guns and cartridges. The giant plane is a colossus. Its only duty is to carry as much weight as possible, and it is able to do this owing to the large surface of its planes. It is worthwhile to look at the gigantic English plane which landed smoothly on the German side of the front. The giant plane can carry an unbelievable weight. It will easily fly away, dragging from three to five tons. Its benzene tanks look as large as railroad cars. In going about in such a colossus, one has no longer the sensation that one is flying. One is driving. In going about in a giant plane, the direction depends no longer on one's instinct, but on the technical instruments which one carries. A giant plane has a huge number of horsepowers. I do not know exactly how many, but they are many thousand. The greater the horsepower is, the better. It seems not impossible that the day may come when a whole division will be transported in such a thing. In its body, one can go for a walk. In one of its quarters there is an indescribable something. It contains an apparatus for wireless telephony by means of which one can converse with the people down below. In another corner are hanging the most attractive liver sausages which one can imagine. They are the famous bombs which cause such a fright to the good people down below. At every corner is a gun. The whole thing is a flying fortress, and these planes with their stays and supports look like arcades. I have never been able to feel enthusiasm for these giant barges. I find them horrible, unsportslike, boring, and clumsy. I rather like a machine of the type of Le Petit Rouge. If one is in a small chaser plane, it is quite immaterial whether one flies on one's back, whether one flies up or down, stands on one's heads, etc., one can play any tricks one likes, for in such a machine one can fly like a bird. The only difference is that one does not fly with wings as does the bird albatross. The thing is, after all, merely a flying engine. 
I think things will come to this, that we shall be able to buy a flying suit for half a crown. One gets into it. On the other end there is a little engine and a little propeller. You stick your arms into planes and your legs into the tail. Then you will do a few leaps in order to start, and away you will go, up into the air like a bird. My dear reader, I hear you laughing at my story, but we do not know yet whether our children will laugh at it. Everyone would have laughed fifty years ago if somebody had spoken about flying above Berlin. I remember the sensation which was caused when, in 1910, Zeppelin came for the first time to Berlin. Now no Berlin street man looks up into the air when an airship is coming along. Besides giant planes and little chaser planes, there are innumerable other types of flying machines, and they are of all sizes. Inventiveness has not yet come to an end. Who can tell what machine we shall employ a year hence in order to perforate the atmosphere? This is the end of The Red Battle Flyer by Manfred Freiherr von Richthofen. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com.